Welcome to River Foursquare. We're so happy that you're with us today. I'm Pastor Rosanna. This is Pastor Andrew. And we welcome you to our communities. If you are joining us in an in-person community, we're so thankful that you took the time out of your schedule to come and meet with us in either Auburn Federal Way or in Covington. And for those of you that are checking this out at 10 a.m. on Facebook, we ask that you join our virtual community. It's a quick little link in the comments. Just click on that and come in and be a part of our discussion. We have a time in our message where everyone gets to communicate together. So if you're not watching with your family or someone else that you can ask those questions to and discuss them together, jump on in that virtual community and be a part of what God's doing there. We also want to announce that Corey too has decided to be one of our council members and was voted on this week. So welcome Corey to the council at River Foursquare Church. We're so glad that you're choosing to serve alongside us. And finally, if you are part of River Foursquare, we invite you to continue giving as we talk about often we give through River Foursquare into the ministries and things that God wants for us, but we do it because it's what he asks of us to give 10% and then offerings and things above that. And you can do that at riverfoursquare.org. Uh, just click on the give tab and it'll explain all the things that you need to do there or text to 84321 and it'll help you get all set up for that as well. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning and this day or this afternoon or evening or however we're watching this, Father, whether being community or driving in the car. Holy Spirit, be here amongst us. Be our teacher today. Be the one who is in sills, inspires, and truth. Help us to use all our gifts and talents, Father, to, to show from the word what you want to communicate today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we talked about recognizing God's favor in your life. That, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes messes happen. There's messes that happen. And sometimes they're not in our control. Sometimes they're done maliciously. People make actions that cause messes. Sometimes they do things unintentional that cause messes. But however the messes happen, it's kind of irrelevant other than it's a mess. And we have to deal with it. And when we're in the mess, we have to look for God's favor. We have to see where, God, what are you doing? What's happening here? Because our favor doesn't come through man. Our favor comes through God. Therefore, God, man cannot take it. He cannot give it. He can't do anything. It's from God. And he is our source. And he's the one who provides favor for us. And last week we prayed for a few of you in our communities, I know in our community and in other communities, for God to show up and for us to be able to begin to see God's favor at work. So that's our first question today. What kind of things did God answer in your life? Were you able to see his favor through the different circumstances that you're walking through? And what kind of answers to prayer did you see this week?
So this week we're going to talk about being fully convinced and, and what, what that looks like. Because Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, right, they were fully convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. And that conviction was seen by all. So with that, let's, let's open up our Bible apps. Let's open up our Bibles to, I guess we can say open up our web pages. Old school. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. I will pick up there. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and peoples and elders, if we are being examined today concerning the good deed done to a crippled man, by what mean this man's been healed, let it be known to all, or to, to all of you. He should have said, just said y'all. That's what he should have done. <laughs> let it be known to y'all and all the people. Yeah, because he wouldn't have to say people anymore. He can just say, let it be known to y'all. Right. Why that's, have to... wh- that's why you use the word y'all. So you don't there have to go. say all of you and all the people. That's the appropriate use of y'all. Absolutely. Use it right now in your communities. Y'all. y'all. Okay. Let it be known to y'all that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you, <coughs> excuse me, before you well, that Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven but given by which men must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. For when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign had been performed through them and is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So Peter and John were being questioned by the Jewish religious leaders, by Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay, good, you just did it. But by Sadducees. And so they're being questioned because this miracle was done and it's causing a commotion. And the Sadducees were opposed to any kind of resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe it, let alone it would be Jesus. They just didn't believe in resurrection from the dead, period. So you got Jesus, who was raised from the dead. They got Peter and John, who keep talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. We already know that 5,000 men were saved Men, not counting women and children, right? So they have a problem, and now they have a miracle that's that's been done. And so they question them, they're like, what power did you do this, right? Because they're trying to find any other reason but God. Because if they blame God or is attributed to God, it creates problems and it creates issues because, okay, what does that mean who Jesus was then? Um, We can't have that. So how else did you do it? Well, what else did you do? And so they're grilling him with questions and everything else. And then Peter and John, basically, they were asked, and they, they boldly proclaimed, they're like, okay, well, Jesus, you crucified, and God raised from the dead. He did it. Deal with that. Process that. And the Jewish religious leaders are basically confronted with the evidence because they dropped the bomb because there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. And so they're confronted with the evidence. Peter and John throw it right at them, and he goes, here it is deal with it. Now you have to make a choice because they understand the Pharisees and Sadducees dilemma they're facing. That they, they're in a corner, they've painted themselves in a corner, and there's no way out. And Peter and John says, okay, here you go. Here's the evidence. Process it. And, and it says that they were dumbfounded when they looked at them. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to do it. Because they couldn't reject the miracle that was literally standing before them because the guy who was crippled is literally standing right before them. They saw him. Right. And they, I love and how they knew him. And it wasn't like it could have been, oh, this random person brought into town and shows up and he pretended to be lame and now he's healed. Like they've known this guy for over 40 years. Well, that and even says in scripture, it says, for a notable sign had been formed through them that is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They even make the statement, they're like, dude, everybody knows this guy. This guy's healed. He's standing there. What the heck do we do? What the heck do we do? And I love how it says that we cannot deny it. We have to blame somebody. And the disciples were fully convinced. They were fully convinced of these undisputable facts that Jesus was risen from the dead, that Jesus was the one who heals, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is God, that they are fully convinced of of these facts, and these facts build their relationship. These facts shape their, their, 
ideology, these facts shaped their actions, and that's why they were able to boldly to st stand before them, as the Pharisees said, these untrained men who spoke some boldly with conviction, because they were fully convinced uh, that Jesus was who he said he was. Fully convinced. And they were dumbfounded. They didn't know how to respond. So that's, that's another question we're going to talk about in our communities here. I want you guys in your communities, I want you to share some undisputable, uh, uh, one more time, share some undisputable facts of your faith. What are some issues of faith that are undisputable? Let's talk about those undisputable facts of your faith. Jesus is God. 
right? And the disciples confronted the the religious leaders that salvation comes from no one else. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved except the name of Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the one who was prophesied by Moses, by Abraham, by David, by Solomon. You can go through the entire New Testament, Isaiah, all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, right? All these prophets all spoke of Jesus, and that's what they confront the re- Jewish religious leaders with. He goes, he is the Messiah, and you killed him. But God raised him from the dead. And the fact that Jesus is God, that he is the Messiah, he's the one who will use who is the sacrifice for our sins, that is still confronting people to this day. Matter of fact, that's an offense to some people. And for some people, it's grace. For some people, it's a problem. Just like the Jewish religious leaders. Philippians chapter (coughs) 2, excuse me, verse 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, the him here is Jesus. Matter of fact, I'll just use Jesus there instead of him. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every name. Then in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus is God. And one day, every single person will have to deal with that. Every person. Whether they reject him now is irrelevant because they will have to deal with it eventually. They will have to yield that he is God, that he is in charge, that he is the one who who sits on the judgment seat, who controls our eternity. He is the one. And we have to deal with it now. It's better to deal with it now than it is to deal with it later. Later's too late. Now is good, right? But we will also all come to deal with that question is, is Jesus God? John 14. This passage is, um, how can I say, very full. This is like the super rich cheesecake that you need like a big glass of milk to eat, right? This is, this is thick stuff. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 7. This is Jesus talking. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. See, in my Father's house, there's many rooms. And if it were, if it were not so, would I have not told you? that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way that I'm going. Well, Thomas, this is Thomas, by the way. Thomas said to me, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, he goes, he goes, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. It's a mic drop moment. This is the one I want to play back on the Betamax machine. I don't think they got it there, though. They absolutely did not get it. Over their head. Right over their head. Even Thomas in this question is like, so right over Thomas's head. It was like, what are you talking about? They did not get this. All right, this is is heavy, heavy stuff. Let's break this down. So Jesus proclaimed, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. That no one goes to the Father except through me. He was already telling me, he goes, salvation, there is no other name under heaven except mine, right? I'm going to earn that right on the cross in just a little period of time. I'm going to earn that right, and salvation comes to me. All those who want to receive forgiveness, ask, and they will, I will, it will be given, right? He was, he was making a proclamation. He goes, I am the way. No one gets to the Father except through me, right? It's not any other God. It's not any other religion. It's not a statue in a church somewhere. It's not holy water. It's not anything else, but it's Jesus and Jesus only. It's Jesus alone that our salvation comes from, period, right? And through that, through Jesus, we receive grace and that we're forgiven. It's by Jesus we're delivered. It's by Jesus we're set free from our sin. It's by Jesus that we're forgiven, that we're restored, and we're giving we're given eternity in heaven. That's how it comes. 
Now, Jesus wasn't done here. He says some even, even more profound things here. He says, he goes on and he goes, he goes, he and the Father are one. And he says this, he goes, if you've seen, or what, what was it? if you've seen me, or seen me, you have seen him. Wow. You know, I, I've heard people say, like, Jesus never claimed to be God. I'm like, have you ever read John chapter 14? Have you ever read this? Because he pretty much, he just said he was. Right. He just said he was. He goes, I and the Father are one. If you, and then he didn't even stop there. He goes, if you've seen him, or if you've seen me, you've seen him. Basically saying we're the same person. Right? And that's that whole Trinity thing, that, that, that Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they're three separate individuals, all same, yet entirely different, but all together at the same time. So we call it a great mystery of faith because our natural intellectual mind cannot, we cannot fully understand this, this union. Matter of fact, there's not an analogy that does it justice. Yes, I know we have all the historic analogies. They're all lame. They're absolutely all lame because they don't do it justice. Because, again, we're trying to put something into our finite knowledge of what we see here on earth into what God's supernatural, powerful, beyond our comprehension, life and It makes us is. look stupid when we yeah. do that. I yeah. guess if it's good, if it helps you understand it, but every analogy is wrong. That... The mystery of the Trinity goes beyond our comprehension. Okay? And once again, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all the same, yet all different. They're all separate, yet together. They've all always existed, and all will always exist. Let's not mistake here, okay? They all three have always existed, and all three will always exist. They're all eternal, and they're all God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, back to that John 14. We just went on a quick Trinitarian rabbit hole. It's good for us. This statement in John chapter 14, that basically Jesus throws it down. He goes, I am a father of one. I am the way, the truth, and life. This is ramifications. This is ramifications because Jesus is God. That has ramifications. Why? Because if Jesus is God, that means what Jesus says is true. Let's just stop there for a second. If Jesus is God, that means what Jesus says is true. It's true. Now, if it's true, if he told us to live a certain way, it's not a, it's not a, I wonder if I should live like that. No, if God, Jesus, told you how we are to live, we have to live that way. It's not an, it's not a negotiation. It's not like, oh, maybe. No. This is, if Jesus told us how we're supposed to live, we must live that way. If Jesus says we can do things, we can why? Because he's God. And furthermore, if Jesus said he would do certain things, he will. Because he's God. These are the ramifications. This is what Peter and John were fully convinced of standing before the council. And that's why they didn't have to well up their boldness. They didn't have to like, oh, let me, let me drum it up from the depths of my soul. No, they were fully convinced. They're like, let me just tell you some facts, Pharisees and Sadducees. Process it, right? Jesus, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead, that's who did this. Deal with it. And so there are some promises. Actually, there's a lot of promises Jesus made because, once again, if Jesus said he would do something, then he will do it just the way it is. John 10.10, 10, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy but this is Jesus who says, I, I have come to have, that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus come to give you life, right? So eternal life and life now, right? Because he's, re he's redeemed sin and death. 
He's reversed the law of sin and death. He's conquered. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, remember? He's conquered that. That's why we can be healed now in this time, right? He's taking care of this. He's come to give you life, eternal life, and now life. That's why they said that the word there is actually a zoe life, which is the God kind of life. Check it out. Do your Greek work. Look at it. John 15, uh, verse 14 and 15. This is Jesus talking to you. He goes, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. Maybe because he's God. No, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. The God of the universe has called us friends. He's called you a friend. You're on a first name basis with him. You're on the short list, right? You're the first guy on his on his text items. When he punches in the first letter of whatever your name starts, with, your name shows up first, right? He's called us friends. If Jesus is God, he would do what he said he would do. We can do the things he said we can do. And if he told us how we're supposed to live, we must live that way. Let's keep going. John Mark 16, 17, 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Believe In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up any serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is the signs or the manifestations or the results of a believer who does what Jesus has asked them to do. And get the terminology I just used there. These are the results of a believer following Jesus. That's why it's fruit. Fruit is a result of a tree growing. Fruit is is responsibility of a healthy tree who's watered, who's planted, who gets the proper nutrients. They make apples or oranges or not kumquats. <laughs> not kumquats. You can read my mind. Not kumquats. He does. He makes kumquats. But here's the thing, those are results of a healthy tree. A healthy believer, these signs will follow them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. They will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues. These are the results of a healthy believer. Luke chapter 12, verse 22 and uh, 30. And he said to the disciples, therefore, <laughs> excuse me, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. Well, you'll eat nor about your body or what clothes you're going to wear. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Look at the birds. People, they neither sow nor reap. They don't have any storehouses. They don't have Costco's. They don't have Walmart. And yet God feeds them and they don't have to use toilet paper because they can do whatever they want. I added that last part. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you being being worried or being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan. Probably actually remove some. The whole, whole thing there. If you then, I'm sorry, if then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why be anxious about the rest? Look at the flowers, how they grow. They neither toil nor they spin. They don't go to the gap in the mall. They don't go to any of the, they don't even have malls. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown on the compost pile, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you a little faith. Do not seek what you're to eat or what you're to drink, nor be worried for the nations of the world seek these things, and your Father knows you need them. There you go. You got it, right? That was a whole pregnant thought there. I just, just dropped it in. You processed it. You got it, right? There's a whole thing there. This is a promise Jesus made. He goes, God, basically what he says, he goes, here, I'll give you the Andrew translation, even though I kind of read the Andrew translation, even though on the screen was ESV, the other translation was mine. That's how I read things. I translate words as I read them in my head. You guys should do that. But here's the thing. Jesus basically tells him, he goes, stop worrying about the things of this life. Stop it. And then he goes, he goes, God knows you need to eat. He made you to eat. God knows you need clothes. Remember, he gave it Adam and Eve the first clothes. He already took care of that one. He says, don't worry about that. 
And then he, he goes on to say, he goes, God knows you need these things. He already knows you need these things. That's a promise Jesus made. If Jesus is God and he makes promises, it has to happen. He's God. Question for our communities. Okay, there's going to be gold stars awarded. If there's not gold stars, blame your community leaders. Okay, so here it is. I want you to talk about in your communities what other promises God has made towards us. It could be ones Jesus made. It could be ones the Father made. It could be ones about the Holy Spirit. Is what other promises God has made towards us. And you can earn bonus stars if you give the scriptural reference behind that promise. Gold stars. Let's talk. So the disciples were convinced, and Peter and John are standing before the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and their boldness stood out like a big sore thumb, like a 
that pulsating foot with the thorn, right? It, 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 it stood out and it was shocking. They didn't expect it because what they figured was they could arrest Peter and John, throw them in the pokey for the night. Right. Intimidate the snot out of them. Intimidate the snot out of them. They'd be like, oh, don't hurt us. Yeah. right? And, and that's what they, they expected. Yeah. They expected them to be fearful. Yeah, we threw them in jail. Hey, we already mm-hmm. crucified their boss. Right? Yeah. That's the process. That's, they already know who Jesus is. Right. This is not like, this is when Peter John up with the mouth, it's not like the first time you've ever heard of this guy. Like, Jehu? No, they know <laughs> who Jesus is. They are perfectly aware he is. Yeah. And they are perfectly aware who Peter and John are. Correct. That yeah. he's his disciple. They know all yeah. of this. And so they're trying to scare them. Like the mobsters. <laughs> like the, they're, they're basically, for you Vegas guys, they're back rooming them. Except in the front room with all the, they're back rooming them, right? Yeah. And actually, they actually get, they get back roomed a lot in they Book do. of Acts. <laughs> They get back to him a lot. <laughs> Whole different topic. All right. So they're standing there and they're trying to intimidate them. And but instead, they just stood there with their formerly crippled man friend, right? <laughs> standing there too. We don't know if he was I don't think he was on the book in that. I think he was summoned the next morning because it doesn't seem to say. Doesn't seem to give a lot of detail about that. But he's standing there too. And I wouldn't want to be that guy. I guess I would want to be that guy, but not want to be that guy. Anyway, long story. And they're standing there, but yet they spoke powerfully and direct to the point. And there was power in their words. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees realized something, that they spoke as Jesus spoke, with power and, was it, as, as the Scripture says, as one with authority. And... So they just saw this. They just witnessed this. And then they put two and two together. Is not only did they talk like Jesus, but now they're doing what Jesus did. They healed this guy. This is a problem. And the disciples were fully convinced. That's why they stood up there with that bold proclamation. Now, why were the disciples fully convinced, right? Because they know Jesus is who he says he was. It's just, just even as we just read John 14, we read those other scriptures. Jesus blatantly says, this is who I am. And was it even elsewhere in scriptures, even before where he says, that he goes, I am, right? There, there's a moment there. Just look that one up, right? That Jesus is who he said he was. And they were convinced because they can do the things Jesus said they can do which they just did, right? And that they are who Jesus says they are. And they're fully convinced. There's no more like, oh, maybe. No, no. They knew that. And now, and we know that because they acted on those beliefs. They acted on those. Obviously. Hey, lame guy. I wonder if they call them lame guy. Hey, lame. Lame guy. I don't know. Is that the offensive? The man formerly known as lame. The man formerly known as lame. Maybe he has like a symbol. He didn't have a word. That was a prince joke. Nobody got it. <laughs> Where did I get it? But as believers, are we fully convinced? Are we fully convinced like Peter and John did? And here's and what we're talking about is it's an issue of faith and of trust and, and belief. And I want to make sure we get this because we've had some bad concepts of what faith is, is faith isn't dependent on circumstances, right? It's not dependent on circumstances. Faith isn't a willpower thing like, oh, I'm going to will it up from the bellies of my soul, bowel region. That's what I was looking for, bowel. You can exercise your faith muscles stronger to make it. That's the dumbest phrase ever, exercising faith muscles. Like, what does that even mean? (laughs) Because I hate that phrase. The reason why, because it makes it seem like that's something you can like will to existence. Right. That, that it's all about what you put into it. And so you yes. don't have enough faith to see God do his miracle in your life because you didn't do enough work. And God's so clear that it's not about what we do. Yes, because if it's about what we do, then it's about us. Right. And it's not. It's not. So it's not about willpower. It's not based on our feelings. Right? It's not based, I was probably a weird face. It's not based on how we feel, but our faith 
and our belief and our trust is based on this, that God is real. Do you know that? Faith. That our faith, belief, and trust is that God is all-powerful. Is he all-powerful? That our faith, belief, and trust is based on that God wants to have a personal relationship with you. He likes you. Right? Hebrews talks about that. In order, we have first have to believe that God exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That's what I just said right there. Right? We have to believe that God wants a personal relationship with you. I'm just saying scriptures, guys. That's all I'm saying. I'm just not giving the titles. Sometimes people will say, I want more faith. I want to go know God more. And an aspect of it, that is admirable. I get what we're saying when we say these things. I'm like, okay, right on. Cool. You want more confidence to believe that God will work in and through you and change your life and the lives of the people as you share about him. Absolutely. Right? And we those, should all want that's that. not a bad aspiration. But know this, <laughs> excuse me, know this, that, that that trust and that faith comes from a personal relationship with him. It has grown. It has grown. Petri dish. Not a Petri dish. But it has grown. In the dish of relationship. Oh, there you go. I brought it all back around again. Woo, bonus, but gold star. All right. It, but it's grown in relationship with him. And here's the thing is, you guys know this. It all started with the Holy Spirit communicating to us. Well, what do I mean? Well, we know that no one can confess Jesus Christ as Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer, if you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, if you've laid down your sin before Jesus, the Holy Spirit has spoken with you because he's convicted you and you responded, right? The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. So whether or not we respond to it is, determines our salvation. Ooh, that was good. Write that down, okay? That was good. So our response has led to that restored relationship. We've received salvation. That's where our faith began, because at that moment, when the Holy Spirit convicted and we responded, we can't respond to someone we don't know exists. Because we responded, we're saying, God, you're real. Because we responded, we're, we're, establish, we're establishing the hierarchy of, of events, as in God is greater than us, that God had laws, that we sinned. Therefore, we have to come subject and ask God, the one we violated his trust and his laws, to ask for forgiveness, right? That's where our relationship began. And that's where that relationship has to continue to be fostered, to know him more. So a natural example would be, as you know, we meet somebody, hey, I'm Bill, I'm Ron, whatever, wherever the exchange is. Oh, wait, elbow hook. I don't even do that. I, th I, th I think a fist bump. Like, I, I, that's what they did at their different conventions, right? They were yeah, fist I bumping. Think the, I, think, I think that's what's going to be. It's going to be the Howie Mandel fist bump. I think that's going to be the the deal because everything else just looks silly. That still looks like we're still shaking hands. I don't know. Discuss. Still but human connection. It's still human connection. We still have that human connection. It's 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 our humanity. There's a whole theological thing there. So we met someone. We met somebody. And we start to build a relationship. Now, sometimes you meet somebody and there's a really strong connection. You're like, ah, oh, you know, I some I like I like that guy. And sometimes you meet somebody you're like, oh, whoo. No, right? We, we, we've had these conversations. You guys have all experienced this, right? But in the, even in that relationship, even when there was a natural connection, it took time to build absolute trust. That's usually months and years. And, you know, our older friends are the ones we trust more. Why? Because we've known them the longest, right? But it, that relationship and that trust is built. It's getting to know that person's character and nature, like, oh, this person's always trustworthy. This person always tells the truth. This person's always on time. One of my big sticklers. Got to be on time. Um, we, we look at this, and we put this into our computer, and it tallies, 
and we form an opinion or uh, a personality profile of every individual we've ever met, just so you know. Or is that we, the circle of trust? Yes, and that forms the circle of trust. You're either in or you're out. But, but we put that in the computer and we form this personality profile of this person. Our personality profile of God has to be formed. We have to get to know him, to be convinced like Peter and John. We have to build our relationship with the Father because we're putting data into the computer. We're saying, this is who God is. This is who God is. So how do we build that profile? How do we shape that personality profile? And I'm not saying this isn't even something we actively do. I guess you can actively do it, but this is a process that normally just happens. Because you spend time together. Because you spend right? time together. You don't actually realize you're doing this, yeah. but you're doing this. It's, it's subconscious. Ooh, I got real nerdy on here. So how can we actively do it? What is some purpose behind it? Well, there's some things. Let's just go into it. <sighs> Worship on your own. Worship on your own. If, corporate, if, you, if a corporate worship gathering is the only place you worship, you missed it. That's a big, that's a bed, big red letter F on your test. You failed. Because that means you needed everything else to engage in relationship with God. And you needed somebody else. Now, I'm not saying corporate worship is bad. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is it absolutely is an important part. But we have to do it on our own. And it's out of our own, we get more out of corporate worship, right? That's how we all engage together. We enter into corporate worship. We worship because everyone has worshiped privately. Now we get to do it together. And there's power in that. But we have, there's also power doing it individually. And here, let's go more depth in this. It's not just singing a song here and there, but it's deciding a time to worship him. Right? And so I'm going to take some time to be with God and you worship him. Now, it might start with a song, and as you open to the Holy Spirit, it grows into a dedicated time in whatever that moment is. Yeah, but it has to, you have to just start. You have to say, you know what, I'm going to spend some... Excuse the word. Focused. Focus. I was going to say quality, yeah. but I didn't want to say the word. Focus time with God. Yeah. What else? Scripture. Have a regular reading or a regular scripture reading time. Getting to know and reading about all he's done. Put that into the computer. That's why I just had you done. Remember that last community question? What other promises God's done? I just literally did it. You just did it just then. You went out. You searched. You came. You brought things back to your remembrance. You study. Study scripture. I gave you three study assignments in this message. Go back, rewind, or jeeper, go back, rewind, okay? I gave you three assignments. Study those. Study those. And when an issue arises, when a problem, when a mess happens, right? Go seek scriptures out to figure out if, the, if, if God has a plan and intention and words about this mess. What does scripture say? What else? Conversation. Speak with him. Talk with him. Telling and confiding, and confiding in him everything and expect an answer. Notice I didn't mention the word prayer until just now, and I probably just blew it. Because if I was to say the word prayer, we instantly go into, let me write off my list. Great. Cool. I'm glad you have a list. Cool. But wait for answers. That's why I say conversations. And wait for his direction and insight and things that you weren't even thinking about praying for too. Absolutely. Just listen. Listen. Ask. Listen. Wait for a response. Just like you would in a normal conversation with people. Like you say something and you stare at them. And there's this moment like. Your turn to talk now. Okay. Have that moment with him, right? Like, <laughs> have that moment. Have that conversation. To be in relationship, we have to engage in relationship with a purpose and an intention. And we convey that, we can convey that through the day. It just doesn't have to be a dedicated time, which is powerful. Don't get me wrong. But don't stop with that. Right? Maybe that's your starting point. Cool. Keep going. Have the conversation throughout the day. Remember, if we believe God exists and he's real, by the way, he's also with us. That's a promise. Right? It's a promise. Matter of fact, Jesus said, he goes, he goes, the Holy Spirit just won't be with you, but the Holy Spirit will be 
in you. Everybody just said it out because we've hammered it for like eight weeks ago. We hammered it. He'll be in you. So because of that, engage in conversation throughout the day with him. Or what do I do here? I'm confused here. Oh, Jesus, that was really hard. Um, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> Whatever it is, have that conversation. Engage him because Jesus wants to have a relationship with us. So where are we at with all this? Jesus is God. Jesus gave promises to us. Our relationship with him is crucial and important. It's what gives life. It's what gives life. And if we're struggling with trusting in God, if we're struggling with with faith, engage in that relationship. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. Because the disciples, Peter and John, were fully convinced we have to be fully convinced as well. And we have to engage in relationship and see what God will do. And see what God will do. So that's the question and prayer point we're going to have in our communities is, is an area of your life which you need to be fully convinced? Is there an area that you need to engage more in relationship with? Is there an area in that you're struggling? And let's, and let's pray for each other. Or, and, and I'll add one more in there. Maybe it's, it's you struggle with some promises Jesus made. Like, oh, it's been a long time coming. Let's pray through that too, right? Because if Jesus said it, he will do it because he's God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you are God that there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the name of Jesus. And all those who come to you can receive forgiveness. So, Father, I pray for people who haven't received forgiveness from you, that they can come and confess their sin. Father, we just pray that we are being fully convinced. We're engaging in relationship. Help us to make time to engage in relationship so we can be fully convinced. And, Father, we thank you that these fruit and results will follow us because we're just being believers. And when it's time to stand and speak what needs to be spoken, we'll do it being fully convinced. In Jesus' name.